Hello and welcome to episode 140 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, with the World Cup underway in Qatar, we look at what might be peak. We look at what might be the peak of petrol state decadence. I mean, what does $200 billion even get us? A soccer tournament without beer? Hell, even my kids' Pee Wee soccer tournaments had beer. The governor of Tokyo has solved the energy crisis. The solution? Turtleneck sweaters. Speaking as a Canadian, wait until they hear about toques and woolly socks. Well, the COP27 climate summit was a bit of a wash. Well, the COP27 climate summit was a bit of a wash. You know, like standing in the middle of Miami. Domino's Pizza is moving to Chevy Bolt electric delivery vehicles. They've ordered 800 bolts from GM, and if they don't receive the cars in 30 minutes, they're free. All that and more on this edition of the Clean Energy Show. Oh, Nelly Brian, we're back with another show, another week. We're nonstop robotic machines here. Yeah, lots going on. And also this week, will I fit into the surprisingly sexy new Prius? The answer will sadden you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Biden gives billions to the U.S. power grid, and Canada follows the U.S. in installing heat pumps in regions where oil furnaces are popular. And I still can't figure out why oil furnaces are popular. I didn't, they just didn't want to run the... They just became popular, I think, you know? When yeah, rural, went rural areas where it's, it's hard to get them on the grid, I guess. And how are you this week? I'm going to tell you right now that I'm not well. I've been you sick. You sound uh, terrible, James. You sound awful. <laughs> No, I'm not possessed. That is my lungs. Um, I've had uh, illness, a flu, since last we met, Brian, pretty okay. much. Um, but it's not COVID. Well, uh, here's what I did. I, um, <laughs> I tested my family because they're yeah. all sick. They gave it to oh, me. Yeah. My daughter brought it home from high school. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was going to get sick. So I just tested. Mm -hmm. They've tested. My wife and, and my daughter tested and they're negative. So I thought, yeah, I'm not yeah. going to stick anything out of my nose. It's not like I have something different. I don't go anywhere, as you know. You don't go anywhere. <clears throat> so, I mean, I've, I've had a hellish number of days. So I am barely able to be here today. And by the end okay. of the show, I will be soaked in sweat. Um, oh, dear. Because I'm still, you know, doing anything is like a chore. Mm -hmm. I skipped now, lunch yesterday because I couldn't go downstairs. Oh, no, that's terrible. And this well, is that, one of my favorite that's... meals of the day. <laughs> That maybe answers my question because the pet peeve of mine, people often say they have the flu when what they really mean is that they have a cold. So you said you have a flu. Do you really believe it's the flu? Damn it. Or is it a bad cold? I, I, I was going to jokingly bring the CDC chart on this to the show and I thought, <laughs> no, I'm not going to. But now I wish I did. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a pet. People say that all the time. Oh, I've, I had the flu. And it, like, no, no, no. You just had a bad cold. If you've got the flu, it te te typically means you cannot go to work or go downstairs for lunch. Yeah. Well, there, there are a lot of, there's overlaps. Okay. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, having fever and severe aches is, um, very uncommon for colds. You can have a mild fever, right. you can have a brief fever, but uh, to have a right. long fever, and severe aches, uh, which I did, even with pills, you know, I've been mm -hmm. throwing down pills left and right until yesterday when I decided I've had enough, but I took one for the show. So maybe it'll kick in halfway through. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, uh, you yeah, know, I had to do some, some harrowing things. like go drive my family home from the gray cup, the, uh, super bowl of Canada, yeah. uh, because they were volunteering there. Cause my daughter's going on a a school trip. And that was one way to fundraise. Well, it killed my wife. She was a little bit sick still. And she mm -hmm. had to work 10 hours one day serving rich people, uh, which is always <laughs> fun. Then my daughter asks, dad, uh, is it legal to quit high school and go get a job? And I said, <laughs> look, look, young lady, you want to be the people getting served, not the servers. Okay. You want to stay in school. You want to be those mm -hmm. rich bastards. Uh, getting hors d'oeuvres served to them by people like you, uh, raising yeah. money for school trips. You don't want to be the person who's 30 years old and has six kids yeah. and is trying to serve. I mean, we need those people. Those people will exist, but well, that's not your goal. What if she quits goal. school and becomes an entrepreneur and, and starts a, you know, a, a million dollar web company? Well, sure. 
Um, <laughs> I think she's more likely to start a bakery or some, some, some sort. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, not, not a huge amount of money in that. <laughs> no, but people do do that. Uh, there's a lot of people who do that. In fact, there's a number of successful local businesses which are at least popular with people uh, who rave about their, their goods and, and make Yeah, no, there's been some, there's some great bakeries. Finally, there's great bakeries here. There never used yeah. to be. And it was always ironic because we're surrounded by fields of wheat. There's just nothing but wheat around here. Mm -hmm. But 20 years ago, you could not get a decent loaf of bread in the city. It was crazy. But now there's some really great places. <laughs> and what's to do with you? Okay. So, um, breaking news. I think we're probably the first podcast to deal with this important topic there is an important website on the internet that has been down for four days now. And it's not Twitter. Uh, it's not Twitter. It's more important than Twitter. It's uh, gocomics.com. Gocomics.com. Yes. This is a website I go to every single day to get my daily comic strips. You know, I was always a newspaper guy. And one of the reasons I liked newspapers was reading the daily comics. Now, many years ago, I switched to reading the comics online because you can get whatever comics you want. You don't have to just settle for the ones that are in your newspaper. So I go to this website every single day, gocomics.com, to read a handful of comic strips. And it's been down for four days. When was the last time you had a website you visited and it was down for four days? I, people don't have patience for that anymore. Um, a four no. hours would be pushing the limits for most people. Four days, and you can get a lot of the comic strips in other places, but there's a handful that are only on gocomics.com. Uh, it's driving me crazy. I've been looking into it, and cybersecurity apparently is the issue. Uh oh. And, um, you know, there's not a huge amount of information on, on the web, which is why, you know, we're an important news source now for this story. But oh, um, getting the word out it, there. Yeah. Anyway, it's driving me crazy. Well, do you, do you want I, to explain I, what a comic strip is to people under 45, <laughs> briefly? A few panels in a newspaper, usually with a punchline. Okay. Um, you know, the, the one I'm really missing is Nancy and Nancy Classics. And this was a comic strip I, I didn't know about really much in my youth, but Nancy by Ernie Bushmiller, which ran like in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and they they do reprints of this on Go Comics as well as the new strip, which is, is quite good. So I don't know. I'm having withdrawals. Another problem I have is I don't have enough fluids uh, to get through the show. I was <laughs> about to start the show and I have this giant water bottle from Costco that I've got an electric pump on the top with the lithium battery in. It chose now to quit. What? It's got a pump on it? No, I bought the pump on Amazon. You could basically use these things in water coolers, although they're not quite water cooler size bottles. They're a little below that, but they're still as about as, as much as a human can carry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, and maybe beyond. I had my son happen to be home for Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving in the head. So we decided we're only going to buy it when our kid is home from college to lift it upstairs because okay. it's a, uh, <laughs> it's crazy heavy. Um, like it's one of those giant water bottles with them with a pump on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't, it, I put the pump on it. You, you can buy these pumps on Amazon uh, for like 18 bucks. And uh, mine just went dead right when I needed it most before I was going to fill up a water bottle before the show. And and now I'm like a little, I'm going to have to be careful. Very wow. careful. Ration. And, ration any coffee water. fits and, and I'm done. <laughs> I mean, the show's going to come to an abrupt end. So, Well, if you have to pause, let me know. I certainly can't go downstairs for water. I'm not, you know, that strong. <laughs> um, no, well... At least, I mean, it sounds like you're in better shape than you were yesterday. What have you been watching on TV while I've been sick? Yes. Well, it's time for Brian's Movie Corner. Brian's Movie Corner. You mentioned this last week. There's a documentary on Netflix called Fugitive, The Curious Case of Carlos Ghosn. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you watched it yet? No, I skimmed it a bit because I was trying to see if they talked about... Uh, the leaf in his history. No. Okay. No. So yeah. Sadly, there's, there's no real information about electric cars, but it was a nice refresher in who Carlos Ghosn is. I'd kind of forgotten like what a superstar he was in the automotive world. He was originally the CEO of Renault like 20 years ago or something, 25 years ago. And he turned the company around, like they were headed towards bankruptcy, mm -hmm. he turned around Renault, and then he became the CEO of Nissan at the same time turned around Nissan. 
um, they were heading into bankruptcy as well, that he made both companies uh, very profitable. Um, and then he got arrested for, you know, uh, em allegedly embezzling funds from uh, Nissan and then very famously escaped the country in a giant case um, on a private jet. He literally snuck out of the country after he was released on bail. And uh, so, yeah, it's a pretty good doc. It was interesting. Yeah, unfortunately, there was really nothing about electric cars. He was one of the proponents of the original Nissan Leaf. So um, maybe they're lagging in electric cars because he's no longer there. I'm not sure. Well, you know, you know, in the documentary, um, well, the, first of all, there was a documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? This is about yep. the EV1 program, the first attempt at... Uh, a car company making EVs that was uh, yeah, the, GM. the General Motors EV1. Like 99, 2000 in that area. Then they destroyed them all. Then they didn't let anyone buy them. Uh, legendary. And that was a good documentary. And then there was the Revenge of the Electric Car, um, which came at the point where, um, you know, Tesla was getting launched and trying to get the S off the ground, their first mass-produced car, I believe. And, um, you know... There was Carlos talking to Elon at the auto show and they were kind mm -hmm. of, it was awkward. It was a very cool encounter mm -hmm. because it was awkward to mm -hmm. egomaniacs who are, didn't want yeah. to give anything away. Um, but Carlos had said at that time that uh, we're doing this just to hedge our bets. You know, if, if electric vehicles take off, you know, we'll be prepared. Um, but he didn't really get behind them. He didn't make them compelling enough. It, mm -hmm. He... he basically looked at the car for the first time without approving it. You know, <laughs> he just looked at it at the auto show. Oh, this is what it looks like. Okay. But you know, it, and it was not a great looking car. It was divisive. Uh, I don't hate it. Um, there's a lot of, you know, it, it's iconic in a way because it's, it's yeah. designed with big buggy headlights to deflect the wind so that you don't hear them on the mirrors, uh, mm -hmm. because you would in an electric car cause they're so quiet and. Yeah, it's just, and then who else was there? Was Chevrolet? There was what's his name? Which with, with uh, GM, the uh, cigar smoking. What's his name? I can't remember. Bob his, Lutz. Bob Lutz, the legendary Bob Lutz, who yeah. always said that EVs would fail and a Tesla would fail. And yeah. um, but then he he was the guy sort of behind the Volt, which was coming out. So yeah. there was three things. There was a trifecta. There was yeah. The Nis this is history now. This used to be just my daily life. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it was the Leaf, the Volt with a V, which was a plug-in hybrid essentially it, mm -hmm. it was an ev with a backup engine and then yep. there was tesla getting off the ground uh mm -hmm. this was all happening 2010 and this is mm -hmm. when this documentary was made and the first model years were 11. Uh, by the way there is a uh, cadillac elr i think it's called for sale in regina which was based on the the volt platform they only made a couple thousand of these things there. So they're kind of rare, but it's a really good kind of plug-in hybrid Cadillac with all the luxurious. What's Cadillac it going for? I'm not sure. It was still kind of incoming. I saw a, a little thing on the web, but. What's it called again? Yeah, ELR, I think. ELR, Cadillac right. ELR, I think. Interesting. Um, yeah. But anyway, so Carlos Ghosn, yeah, a, a controversial figure. And there's no particular conclusion in the documentary because he managed to escape Japan and go to Lebanon where he's originally from and he is I guess not been extradited or anything so he's never gone on trial so no one really knows uh, what the full story is but there was another executive at Nissan that was sentenced to was was uh, for helping to cover up his salary they were trying to keep his salary quiet because it was quite high so somebody at Nissan did do time for that and then the pilot, like the guy who got, it was like a U.S. Special Forces guy yeah. who got him out of the country. He ended up doing a couple of years oh, of time. Oh, I hope it was Japan. worth it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I hope it was worth it. I, I don't know. I mean, I assume he was well paid. Carlos uh, has got a lot of money. Oh, uh, well, when, when you're that rich, you're, you're going to, you know, throw at the dollar to millions really quickly. Just mm -hmm. take them. I uh, just get but it I to wasn't, freedom quite clear on why he ended up back in Japan and in jail when Carlos Ghosn is, has managed to not go back. Um, well, I think the pilot, yeah. he probably had a business there. He probably had a relationship with Japan if he was able to fly I mean, it could there. be, but he was, he was an American, so, yeah. um, but they didn't really explain that. But, um, yeah, so it's, it's, they made the point a couple of times that, um, in Japan, the conviction rate is 99%. So wow. 
if you are arrested in Japan, there is a 99% chance that you will be convicted. So the documentary sort of implies that there's something kind of hinky with the, the, the Japanese oh. uh, justice system. Well, that's that, why you flee. Um, you don't wait for your trial. And that's why <laughs> you flee. Basically, the so, charge is the... Is the <clears throat> yeah, like as soon as you're arrested, it's game over. And, and Carlos Ghosn, in, in an interview um, after he got out, well, he, he apparently did 150 days in solitary confinement when they first arrested him. Right. Yeah, I remember Under that. what he says were inhumane conditions. And I mean, well, just that alone. Well, if you don't have like, a butler, it's inhumane. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, no butler. But like his hands were cuffed and solitary confinement <laughs> for like 150 days. Yeah, I'd, I and, probably would have done the same thing, guilty or not guilty. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So he um, he just yeah he felt like he wasn't going to get a fair trial, and you know very luckily managed to escape. Like they had to this, so he was in a case that they said was an instrument case. They were, pretended that they were musicians, right? And it was a big square case, but they said it was some type of an instrument, and it couldn't go through the scanner because it was sensitively tuned like it, it had just right. been tuned or something yeah you can't put it through the scanner i could just and picture then, them putting it through the scanner and seeing it carlos <laughs> going in there all curled up all curled up so uh yeah i don't know it's it's uh, it's only about 90 minutes it's uh an interesting little dog well he is guilty brian i've looked at the evidence and it seemed okay. pretty over what pretty compelling case that he uh you know i don't know what what the this punishment would have been for him but yeah. You know, why was he in solitary confinement? You know, I, I don't understand that if he was cooperative. But also, why um, why would he need to embezzle money when, like, his salary was nine, he was making nine million euros a year. Um, why would he need to embezzle money? I don't know. Maybe he had gambling debts. Maybe he was paying for the LEAF program. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Well, let's get on with the show. COP27 wrapped up in Egypt, and uh, it's been a mixed bag of stuff for them. Uh, I'm not going to yeah, talk I mean, about it too much, but what did you think about how that went? Well, it's how these things usually go, is that there's lots of optimism, and then it's ultimately a compromise. There's always a compromise at the end of it, because, you know, this is a UN climate summit with hundreds of countries and, you know, getting everybody to agree um, so I don't know. Sounds like it was not the best, but also not the worst. Well, there was a lot of, I, I see this as a, as a, a very crucial time because there's a lot of yeah. fossil fuel, uh, bad things going on. They're, you know, trying to claw at what they can to make as much money as they can. Yeah. And they would be happy to throw the climate down and our targets with it. So Bloomberg had a story on it. They said the United Nations Climate Summit just barely avoided ending in a deadlock. They went into extra a day or so afterwards. And the final compromise left big doubts over the prospect for new efforts to curb emissions. I quote, despite attempts by big powers like the United States, India, and the European Union, the uh, agreement failed to raise ambitions on reducing emissions. That could mean a, the world misses the 1.5 degree Celsius warming target that enshrined the 2015 Paris Agreement. Calls to phase out all fossil fuels, not just coal, which is all they could come up with. They couldn't touch fossil fuels. Uh, and to peak global emissions by 2025, which is likely to happen anyway, according to the IEA, uh, were shot down by many nations who export oil and... I'm proud to say we have a bad record, Canada, on this, but we didn't oppose it, even though we are a big oil exporter. I'm sure it had a different government been in power, that would have been the case probably. But So while the phase down of all fossil fuels didn't make it to the final text, momentum grew around the idea that wasn't even in the cards before the summit. As many as 80 countries now support it. So we're, we're moving towards, you know, banning fossil fuels. Basically, yeah. we're getting closer and to then that. There was a, a like a damage fund as well. Right. So that was a big part every, of it. Everyone agreed to put in money to a fund for the countries most affected by climate change. Yeah. And that's, that's all I'll, I'll talk about on that. But we'll update some more stories as we go here. What's happening with, uh, um, let's see here, the heat pumps. $250 million in Canada, right? Yeah, so I think we'd mentioned this before. There's a few more details. So there is a Greener Homes grant here in Canada that I've applied for, and they have now expanded the program with another component to it. 
which is to switch people from heating oil to a heat pump. So there's an extra $250 million now in Canada. It's a separate stream in the Greener Homes Grant, and it won't technically be available until early 2023, but this is mostly for people in Atlantic Canada where heating oil is apparently a fairly common thing. Rural properties and everybody gets heating oil delivered. It's not a thing around here at all. We don't have this here. No. Even, even though we have lots of rural properties. We have um, natural think, gas. Uh, yeah. We have the government who did that, right? We had a government yeah, utility. It, it, That's kind of why we have government utilities here. And But if you're in a rural property, I think it's mostly propane here. You can get your propane tank filled up. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is this is so up to five thousand dollars. It's only for middle and lower income Canadians, and the twist on this too is you can get the money up front. Usually with this program, wow, you apply and you spend all the money, and yeah. then you get a reimbursement. But this, because it's meant for middle income and lower income Canadians, you can actually get the money up to five thousand dollars up front uh, to switch you, and you know it the potential is to save like as according to them as much as forty seven hundred dollars a year um on your heating costs so, so what would a heat pump cost have you done any looking into it for your own house uh yeah, i mean as much as like twenty twenty five grand but i i think ah, these, for a heat pump uh, i think it it depends and I, like we need of course these super frigid cold heat pumps I think in Atlantic Canada, it's not as cold. Oh, okay. and hopefully it wouldn't cost as much, maybe 10 or 15,000. Uh, but yeah, you get the money up front. And I checked in on the, this is sort of similar and in line with what's happening in America with the um, Biden, what's that called? The IRA, the era? IRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah. That starts on January 1st, 2023. Um, if you want to get a rebate on your heat pump in the U.S., it's anything installed after January 1st. So you can get a, a, a after the fact rebate for yourself, not going fr from um, an oil furnace, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to go through the normal program and I think I'll get up to 5000 as well. Uh, for but, my it, you know, pump, it's too bad though, because that would be hard for somebody low middle to finance 10 grand if they didn't, if it wasn't yeah. pressing. Um, yeah. And I mean, I guess that's why this program is that way. It, it's, um, I get like in Atlantic Canada that, you know, like rural properties are probably fairly inexpensive. So you can have like lower income people that own houses yeah. and, um, they're going to be in trouble, but yeah, you can get the money up front, which is, uh, very cool. And yeah, very much in line with what's happening in the U S, um, with the inflation reduction act. So, um, I, I encourage everybody to check your local jurisdiction, your local state, your local province to see what rebates are available and things are really going to get rolling in uh, 2023. So basically they're starting where the biggest bang for the buck is. So the biggest savings would be for people yep. with oil furnaces. So they would yep. be most compelled to maybe make yep. that switch, right? And, and heating oil is one of the things that's really gone up in price with the recent uh, inflation that we've been having. You know, I was doing some research on this this morning, and I said that heating oil heats up twice as fast as uh, you get more bang for your BTU, basically, that it, it really oh, yeah. heats up fast. Mm -hmm. Anyway. But probably causes more pollution than natural gas. Yes. Uh, natural gas is relatively clean as far as fossil fuels go, although there's a lot of methane in there. Um the new Prius finally was announced on Wednesday uh, in Tokyo and in the LA Auto Show. And, you know, there's been lots of speculation about it, so I've been kind of curious. Yep. Um, ultimately, though, you know, the Prius, there are actually Prius fans out there who are saying, wow, it's great, look at this. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think? I've got a picture of it up. Do you, um, do you think? Well, I love this, the styling, like it, it, the, the the design road that Toyota's been going down the last few years, I just do not like. Mm -hmm. And they reached a kind of an apex with that excessively angular design of the, the Prius. So I think they had kind of no choice but to go in the opposite direction. But it almost looks to me like they had designed it to be an EV. Like EVs are often designed for aerodynamics. That's right. That's right. Yeah, they did. They so, They cut down the roof line for that very reason because there was no other way yeah. to gain efficiency. So it's just a huge shame it's not a full EV because it looks like it could be. It looks a lot like the original Hyundai Ioniq, mm -hmm. um, which was 
a very aerodynamic shape. So I, I love the direction they're going. Like this is a huge improvement in terms of the style, I think, of the, the Prius. Um, and But just a shame. It's, it's not fully electric. It really, it just feels like that would have been the correct move. The oh, Prius yes. has been There's around no a long time. Yeah, you just, you know, you obviously you refresh the models every few years and it's totally time for a full EV refresh. And that's not what this is. Now, some people make the argument that at the moment in time that we're in right now, that uh, a plug-in hybrid, which there's a version of that, right? There's a plug-in version yeah. of the Prius. Some people think mm -hmm. all, they all plug in. They don't. They're basically just a hybrid powertrain which utilizes an electric motor to be more efficient, but it's all gas doing the the, mm -hmm. the energy. So uh, the, the plug-in version has gone up in range from yeah. pretty significantly. Basically, the energy density of the batteries have gone up. It's taking up the same space to go from, uh, I think it was 40 kilometers to now 60 kilometers or 40 miles now of EV range, which is a lot more usable. Oh, yeah. and, and in Canada, uh, we would get the full $5,000 off. So that means, you've heard it here first because no one else has said this, the plug-in Prius Prime PHEV will be cheaper than the normal Prius. So why would anyone buy a Prius mm -hmm. in Canada? Is the rebate. This is the situation that was like that in, in uh, California. Yeah. When the Prius Prime first, there was, there was no point. I mean, you... If you're buy even if you don't care about plugging it in, why would you buy it? Because you have to resell it. You have to have a, yeah. a residual value. You might as well have the one that costs more. Uh, so it makes no sense for them to sell anything but the Prius Prime in Canada. Um, and they also went with more horsepower, which I thought was a bit weird. Like it's they... yeah, they really bumped up the horsepower finally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> after twenty years and of being something... mocked by truckers, by bumper People stickers on truckers. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, quite a lot faster now, um, but of course that cuts into the miles per gallon a little bit, but not not too bad. Yeah, overall it, though, you know, I think it's um, it could be more efficient than it is, but the, I mean, at the zero to sixty is a lot faster, way faster. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's that's fun, but now here's a, here's my big problem with it, and that is that it sits lower. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, my wife has a Prius, if you're new to the show, and that's her work car that she has to have, um, you know, inspected constantly because it's used for work. She takes, um, social work clients around in it. And, you know, we have the Leaf as the other car and the Leaf is actually so much more comfortable for an aging man like myself. It's, <laughs> it's just, it rides so much higher that it is, um, I don't know how this compares to the Model 3 but I do know that the Model 3 is kind of low. Um, a bit low, yeah. And I'm having trouble getting into the Prius. I, I hate getting in another Prius. And it would be, like, even my head, I have to, like, somehow, I'm only six feet. I mean, people yeah. are taller than six feet now. It seems like they're not making it for old people. Like, they should be making it for old people because young people aren't going to buy this, are they? Um, so no. I'm going to have less headroom and a lower seating position. It's going to be harder to get my fat ass in and out of that thing. They're not going to even talk about pricing or announcing it until, you know, sometime in the first half of next year, as far as the prime is concerned. So that doesn't mm -hmm. do me. I need a car now, Brian. You should go buy that, buy it's, that caddy. Yeah. Yeah. You should actually look into it. It could be, uh, yeah, it could be fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, but, cars are so uh, expensive now. The used car market is so crazy, but that's the only reason. Yeah, I don't know. And I think it's only a two door, but and probably oh, kind of low. But oh, oh, two door, that is weird because it's, if it's the same platform. But yeah, okay, yeah, that won't work. <laughs> Fortunately, I guess the Rav Four Prime would be a better fit for you, just because it's taller. Oh, the Rav Four Prime would be a dream. <laughs> it would be small SUV. I don't even necessarily want to go that far. You know, these really small crossover things, there's a lot of them around. I don't know which ones would compare, but basically they're like the Leaf, but maybe a, just a tinch bigger in yeah. all directions. And that's really all I need. And yeah. with the hatch, you got all kinds of cargo availability. The, 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 the leg room in these cars is really good. So it's, and the headroom is really great. Uh, you wouldn't need too much more. Unilever may launch ice cream from cow-free dairy in a year. This is an update to a previous story because we've been talking about precision fermentation. And here it is, Brian. Here's the headline. 
you know, you wait for things to happen and then there it is in front of you. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the dairy industry likely to be the very first of the animal-based products. Here's a clip from the industry. robot who reads the Bloomberg stories. The company is working on a process called precision fermentation that uses substances like yeast and fungi to produce milk proteins in a vat. A product could be available in about a year. If successful, Unilever could be the first major food company to create an ice cream made from cow-free dairy, dubbed lab-grown milk, in a burgeoning industry dominated by smaller startups. A consumer giant like Unilever developing a precision fermentation version of one of its major brands raises hopes that the technology can scale up and be cost-effective. Yeah, so the idea is that it's going to be cheaper and then also cleaner, much cleaner. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a version of this ice cream already exists because there was a picture of Tony Siba eating some of it in that last um, YouTube video that he put up. So I, I think this does exist, but it's probably kind of expensive and only in health food stores, whereas Unilever... They're looking... It, it would probably be quite product. expensive, yeah. Uh, so right now, the idea is... He says by 2030 that, you know, the proteins in milk is going to be replaced by fake stuff or precision fermentation. And yeah. it's going to be cheaper and dairy is going to go bankrupt. And this is the first sign of that happening. They're doing it. Maybe they'll advertise it as an expensive, but greener option, I'm guessing at first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And more expensive at first, but I think. And unlike, ultimately, you know, beyond meat, there really will not be a difference. It'll be identical. It'll be very identical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you're mostly tasting the fat and the sugar, um, you know, the, the milk right. protein is a uh, part. 3% protein in milk, I think. And and, um, and it's 10% that's it's not water, 90% water, 3% is protein. That's the part you replace. The others are fats and sugars, which are easily replaced, obviously. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I was, speaking of J Japanese automakers, Mazda looks like it could be, and I'm not convinced of this, but it could be doing something significant. They could be the first of the Japanese automakers to actually um, set a target that is reasonable. Uh, Mazda is um, raising its EV sales target to 40% by 2030, and they're investing $11 billion to accelerate this transition. Sounds like they got the memo. <laughs> yeah, well, we were making fun of them for their MX-30, which is a very uh, low-range electric car. they uh, down to selling like only a handful of them. Um, so they've been a real laggard. And so this is their first uh, step up to the plate, you know, 40% yeah. by 20. I mean, it's, it's, it's not maybe what it should be, but it sounds like they're getting the idea, right? I mean, that's, that's something. Yeah. I mean, it's probably too late. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to be a naysayer, but um, at, at least they have a target. 505 um, of these they things survive. they sold through August, Brian. 505. I've sold more brownies at um, bake sales than they have than these cars. It's really, it's such, it's 100 miles of range. Yeah. 160 kilometers of range, which is in today's yeah. market, no good. Unless it's a cheap car, but it's 33,000 U.S., that's a lot of money. You expect something for that. Yeah. I mean, you can get a Leaf, you can get a Chevy Bolt that does way more mileage than that and probably is a more capable car. So, yeah. And they even said this EV has been money. sold out. So you <laughs> can't buy one. So there was a demand there. There's going to be some Mazda fans who want to go EV. But anyway, this is a story about VW. Um, maybe delaying their EV plants. Like VW was maybe one of the great hopes of the EV transition. And now the, the CEO has been replaced, right? Yeah. And as we reported, they're on track to deliver 500,000 EVs this year, which is a significant amount. That's way ahead of uh, everybody else, except for Tesla. Uh, Herbert Deese was their CEO that put all of this in motion. And, um, you know, he really had a radical vision for VW and, and really felt like it had to be a radical remaking of the company or, you know, they were going to run into problems. And uh, so, yeah, so he started a lot of ambitious programs that have gotten them to 500,000 EVs a year, which is significant. But um, he was sort of moved out recently as CEO and the new CEO is 
definitely scaling back Ooh. these plans um, to be Ooh. much, much less ambitious. I don't like that. That's yeah. not... No, I think Herbert Deese was on the right track. And, you know, it's just like with, with Mazda. So Mazda wants to sell 40% EVs by 2030. But that means, you know, there's going to be people to buy the 60%. No, it doesn't that work that way. In 2030 seems unlikely. It doesn't work that way. When when EVs are available, people are not going to want the gas cars. So um, I don't know. The new CEO of VW seems to be and betting. Every that such car commercial on television is electric. Can you buy the cars? Not so much. Yeah. But for some reason, we're in this weird time so where, much. yeah, all the car companies are vying to look like they're. <laughs> and then there's Toyota, who says we're electrified. So mm -hmm. that's enough, right? Electrified. Yeah. <laughs> so VW, they're, they've got the second generation platform that they were planning to come out in 2026. This is, they call this their Trinity EV. And now it's going to be more like 2030 under the new CEO. And, and 2026 20, might've been difficult to actually achieve. That's but not if good. you're moving the goalpost down to 2030, yeah. even 2030 may not... You know, they should be moving it up to 2024 and hey, you may not make the deadline. ambition should be moving but, up you know, anyway. They should move So faster. that's, that's a three-year delay, basically, or worse. Let's hope not. And that's no good. We don't, yeah. we can't, we can't deal uh, with that. Which, yeah. And it was already a kind of a target wasn't that great. wasn't, you know, even as ambitious as it should be. Um, you know, they've just, they've got a lot, it takes a lot to turn a giant ship like VW around. But they're the best and, at it. Uh, the biggest car company in the world are the best it at it. Do they know manufacturing in and out? So what no, the hell? No, they've done really well. I, I think what they're not getting is what you said, impressive. that once the pendulum sort of swings towards EVs and that the, the weight starts to get on the teeter-totter on the EV side. Yeah. Look out, it's not going anywhere. It's going to tip mm -hmm. way over and then you're going to be caught, caught with your pants down. So yeah. who's going to be able to provide those cars? Hopefully, well, Tesla. Yeah. You and I are already at the point where we would never in a million years consider buying another gasoline car, but we're still kind of the outliers. But every year, the percentage of people who won't consider a gas yeah. car uh, and it is. up. It's regular people are, are considering EVs and... Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's people around here with pickup trucks. You, I'm reading about them all the time. Their neighbors are, their business associates are, their clients are, um, this becomes normalized very quickly now. You know, it's, it's really going to pick up. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, let's get on with the show. Yeah, so moving on to Tokyo, the governor of Tokyo, this is Yuriko Koiki. Um, has suggested everybody wear turtlenecks to help okay. reduce their energy bills. And <laughs> it's a, sort of a funny thing and a fun thing to make a joke about uh, off the top of the show. Um, but I'm in favor of this. It's, you know, there's an energy crisis going on. Um, everybody's going to be struggling. Uh, can to I make a make turtleneck power, work? I mean, not everybody can. The next... Yeah, I'm not really, um, I don't think I own Everybody any Everybody owns one, Brian. But um, yeah, the idea is that um, dress warm and you can save money on your electricity bills, which are going up in, in Tokyo, just like they're kind of tending Isn't to Isn't my up, neck that's uh, the coldest everywhere. thing, so, though? I mean, really? Um, I guess they're long sleeve and warm. Well, the idea is that um, there's, here's the quote, warming the neck ah. has a thermal effect. I'm wearing a turtleneck myself, and wearing a scarf also keeps you warm. This will save electricity. Around the you house. The governor of Tokyo. He wants said. people to, around that, their tiny little true. Tokyo apartments to wear a scarf. Yeah. I mean, it sounds radical, but why not? You know, we have the problem here. I don't know what it's like in other places, but we often have this problem in North America where, like, office buildings in particularly often have very poor heating mm -hmm. or cooling that can't be controlled very well. So like there's often a problem around here where people have to wear sweaters yeah. in the summer because the air conditioning is cranked too high and nobody can seem to turn it down. Or I've actually heard of people who have yeah, I've seen that. It's really bad. Desks I've seen that. They run in the summer because 
it's too cold because the air That's conditioning not good. Is, is too high. So, so you're, um, you're overusing the air yeah. conditioning and then but, uh, some poor employee has to use, yeah. uh, you know, a PTC heater to, to sort of yeah. gain back the energy. So I think like this in many ways used to be like a common sense thing where people just dressed warmer in the winter because it was kind of common sense. But, you know, then you go to work in an office building where the heat is all wonky. So maybe it's too hot in your office in the winter time. And then you just end up wearing a t-shirt instead in the winter. Uh, you know, it, it's all messed up. You know, I, I, I wear fleeces and, and sweaters inside the house now, but that's because I'm getting old. I'm still turning up the temperature right, yeah. a tinch more than it should be. And then I'm also wearing <laughs> yeah, yeah. those things. That's not good. Yeah. It is not good at all. I do the same thing. Yeah. I can't laugh, by the way. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll go into a coughing fit. So I don't say anything funny. Well, Brian, as you know, the World <laughs> Cup has started. And I know you don't have World Cup fever, but I do. I've got it. Sure. I took a Tylenol oh, for my what World Cup fever. What you're suffering from is probably World Cup fever. Uh, this morning. Argentina yeah. lost to Saudi Arabia, the biggest upset in World Cup history, some people say. I'm sorry, Argentina, if you're listening. Wow. In fact, this is probably way too soon for me to even bring it up, and I apologize. <laughs> anyway, I was kind of, you know, there's a, of course, all the coverage, it's been announced like 10 years ago that they were getting this. So Qatar, which is a small nation state with oil, um, you know, was accused of, using their oil money to spend on the World Cup and bribe. And there's been some people who've actually been, you know, yeah. charges and so forth. There's a new Netflix documentary. I won't make you watch it, but it's there. Okay. On FIFA. <laughs> so this is a tiny Middle Eastern autocracy with a population of barely 3 million, 3 million people. It's, it's how do they get the world's biggest sporting event? You know, like this is a the by far the world's biggest sporting event. It happens only every four years, uh, but the temperatures there in the summer are fifty degrees Celsius or one hundred and twenty-two Fahrenheit, and that's when the World Cup is is uh, normally played is uh, during that time. Yeah. And I, in as summer. you know, was in Death Valley when it was that temperature. And I could only get out of my, I was a healthier man then, and I could only get out of my car for 10 minutes at a time. My kids could do 12, 13. Yeah. But then you're like facing the Grim Reaper, you know, he starts to encroach on your area, yeah. looking for you to kill you. Because it's just, you can't play soccer in that. It was, it was, yeah. So they built, you know, yeah. I guess they spent $200 billion of their Petro money on this games. They've built eight stadiums. One of them, I'll talk about in a minute, that's a little bit different than the other ones. Uh, <laughs> it's recyclable. We'll just put it that way. Um, but yeah, it's they've got air conditioning. The temperature is only like 24 degrees with like 64% humidity. These games have been checking on them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's perfectly reasonable for soccer. But um, yeah, they had the... <laughs> It just these disrupted all the the soccer schedules because it was in in you know the middle of Premier League and everything else. Soccer is normally going strong, so they had to disrupt everything else. And people have been in the soccer world have been pissed off about this and suspicious of Qatar for a long time. I'll read you a bit from the Atlantic here. It says Qatar might now be home to about three million people, but the proportion of actual Qatari citizens who live there is a little more than ten percent. So that there's hardly any. The rest compromised some very rich expatriates mm -hmm. of other nations and a huge army of poor migrants, up to 6,000 and some may have died, by the way. Uh, this is a whole separate issue, which is not part of our show, but, you know, my God. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, my, my point is that this is the pinnacle of oil decadence. And to think that, you know, thousands of lives were not cared about and lost from other countries to make this little thing. And we'll never the have of, um, this again. This is peak oil. This is, I don't think we'll see crap like this ever again. This is the, the moment in time where it's all going to fall apart. Uh, they did not have any infrastructure. They're not a sporting nation. They didn't have a fan base. They had nothing, but they were very rich with their oil money. But Brian, their new money, 
you know, they haven't had this money for very long at all. Qatar has had huge reserves of natural gas, which was discovered, I think, uh, quite a while ago, maybe the 70s or 80s by Shell, but they just left it there because they couldn't do anything with it. They had all this natural gas and nowhere to, nowhere to get it anywhere. So in the 90s, uh, there was this coup, I think, you know, the, um, the leader of the country, the king or whatever, whatever the term they use for it, left to go on vacation to England and his son took over, which is why I'm, if I'm ever in that situation, I'm never <laughs> leaving because my son would take over in a second. He was just, yeah. sorry, dad. Oh, yeah. So, but he did a good thing in a, for the country in a way because he invested in liquefied natural gas tech so that it could be transported on a ship. So when you cool it, natural gas, you could, it, it's like transporting oil on a tanker, but it's ridiculous how much, you know, it's, it's, it's like minus 165 degrees Celsius or something like that. They are now the third richest country in the world and they learned how to extract natural gas from the ground much more cheaply. So even after they cool it and put it on a ship, a tanker full of natural gas is four times cheaper from Qatar than if it originated in the United States through their normal channels. That's just how, that's why they are so wow. rich is because their gas is cheap even though they have to do that. So they started wow. a sovereign wealth fund though. This is the shocking part that I didn't know about. Uh, even though they blew 200 billion on these games to make them, you know, a respectable country, which is not working out by the way, because all we're doing is talking about how crappy they are, the LGBTQ rights and everything like that. And the fact that they, you know, can't serve beer at the games and they p yanked that privilege two days before. Um, so they started a sovereign wealth fund, though, like Norway did, and they have $300 billion in it because they saw the writing on the wall. They knew that it, our ca mm -hmm. Canadian jurisdictions here who have oil in their provinces don't think that way at all. They think spend, 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 oil forever. Uh, but, you know, when you had yeah. something, you, they didn't always used to have this. So they've only had it since the 90s. So in that short time, they've got a $300 billion sovereign wealth fund. And they're building up infrastructure. Part of the game spending is that, you know, to make it for an investment possible. And I don't know that that's going to work, especially with their human rights problems, that a whole lot of people are going to go there. But they are planning for the end of oil by diversifying their investments around the world. So, yeah, that fund is going into all kinds of things around the world. So, um, you know, there's been, of course, it's supposed to be a carbon neutral <laughs> World Cup, and that's uh, it's a joke. It's, it's a bloody joke. Here's a clip from Bloomberg. <laughs> Organizers estimate that the World Cup will emit 3.6 megatons of carbon dioxide. International flights in and out of Doha will account for the majority of emissions. However, organizers argue that this World Cup will be more energy efficient than others, since fans won't have to fly to different venues and can instead just take public transit. The sticking point is always the flights. Most Olympics and World Cups, it accounts to more than 85% of total emissions. So that surprised me. I guess it makes perfect sense when you hear it. But it's not the building of these eight giant mm -hmm. stadiums and, you know, all the infrastructure around it. It's the flights and during the actual games. And it's the same with the Olympics. It's a very carbon intense thing when all these people do that. Yeah, yeah, when when you got to travel uh, so many people around the world. That's, now, uh, that's the game today uh, was in Stadium 974, which is built with shipping containers. This 40, <laughs> it's not entirely shipping containers. It's like almost, uh, it's like steel girders and shipping containers. But the 40,000 seat stadium hmm. can be disassembled and rebuilt elsewhere. So this is the world's first um tear it down, build it back stadium, supposedly. And apparently if everything goes on shipping containers, it can be shipped anywhere. Um, yeah, so this will be available <laughs> from I Ikea soon, I guess. Quite the price, but yes. It was designed by a French architectural <laughs> firm. Uh, other things they're doing, they're trying to do is they have built solar farms to offset the emissions from the games. And uh, they, you know, they're using electric buses and electric... Um, mass transit. So that's good. They're not, you know, burning their own product and they are supposedly buying carbon offset, carbon offsets, but they're way behind on that, Brian. And Domino's? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Domino's Pizza has announced, and this sort of falls into that category of story that we're going to, you know, have to stop reporting soon because this is just going to be 
uh, business as usual very soon and, and maybe is already. But Domino's Pizza in the U.S. has ordered 800 Chevy Bolts and they're kind of custom painted with the Domino's logo and everything. And they've got about 100 of them so far. And these are going out to Domino's Pizza locations in the U.S. So they will eventually have 800 uh, fully electric uh, delivery vehicles for the fleet of pizza delivery um, vehicles. And of course, it uh, they're doing this because it just makes sense. And the Bolt is not a particularly expensive car. So um, imagine all the money they'll save on gas. Um, this is just, you know, the EV calculation that every business um, in the world is going to be making uh, when it comes to yeah, I wish you know on your Domino's app if you could select an EV to have it delivered like you can on other apps, you know, for ride sharing. Um, yeah, do you ever eat Domino's? That'd be nice. I would think you would hate Domino's. Never. That would be an Auntie Brian it. pizza right there. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> no when we have uh, excellent pizza to choose from in our city, okay. I, I don't see. A well, I I, I agree. I did. It is the the pizza shows up at events at events a lot of times where people will, you know, and you'll have some there. Right. But uh, okay, so Joe Biden has promised thirteen billion dollars uh, for the U.S. Uh, power grid. So um, this is part of the green spending from the U.S. and. As we talk about frequently on the show, the grid all over the world is going to need some upgrades. And so this is a decent amount of money, $13 billion uh, to upgrade the grid. And as we go greener in the next uh, couple of decades, uh, it's important to get the foundation correct first before we do that. So this is a nice, like really forward looking thing I think that the U.S. government is doing. Uh, $13 billion available to do grid upgrades uh, around the country. Yeah. So I think that's great. It is it is subsidizing, you know, what they could probably do themselves, though. How do you feel about that, that the taxpayer is, is subsidizing it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a weird thing about all of this spending, right? Because, you know, companies like Tesla don't even need subsidies, really. Their cars are profitable already, right. and yet they're going to benefit from these subsidies. So it, it's always a bit weird. Um, and, you know, taxing fossil fuels, uh, a carbon tax, it would probably have been the yeah. better way to go with all of this. But, um, you know, however it, it gets done, there's certain things politically that are difficult to do, um, like a carbon tax. So, you know, it's, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily be my first choice for, for how to deal the with it. The thing is but that they'll have it. cheaper electricity to sell probably mark it up, you know, that's the kind of the ironic thing about it. Anyway, uh, the show, which I thought was mm -hmm. going to be half a show, is now running long. So I will tell people that coming up next is the lightning <laughs> round, where we skim through the rest of the week's headlines very quickly, and it'll be a short one this week. Let's dip into the mailbag. Brian, this is a message from Nick. Hello, Brian and James. I live in New England and recently got a 2022 uh, Ford Mach-E, that is an electric vehicle, um, small crossover, right? Um, my battery life, as he calls yeah. it, was originally at 230 miles. He means range. So um, a range of that car when he first got it was 230 miles or 370 kilometers. And now that it is colder out, it is 170 miles and 274. So he's lost about 100 kilometers or 50 miles roughly, of uh, range. So I know about range decreasing in colder weather. My question is, does the range come back when the weather gets warmer? With the cost of new EVs, a range of 170 miles is not acceptable. Fan of the show since day one. Thanks. Wow. That's uh, how many episodes? 140. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Congratulations, <laughs> Nick. Thank you for sticking with us. I don't see how yeah. you put up with Brian for that long, but uh, whatever. Whatever. Um, so, yeah, I would be uh, bold enough to say that I think, James, you and I are the two yes. uh, leading experts in the world. On yes, you've come to the right place, Nick. Weather. We're the experts. Because Alaska has nothing <laughs> on us. We're in the southern Canadian prairies where it gets to minus 40, no. and it has recently. Not this year, but, you know, it has. Yes. And minus 40 Celsius is the same as minus 40 Crossover, Fahrenheit. Yeah. That's where the two scales meet, and it... 
it does get that cold here. So I don't know everything about how the Mach-E, um, you know, battery meter works, but yeah, usually the, the range on any car is calculated on your recent trips. So if your recent trips have been in the cold, then your car is going to be smart enough to figure out, okay, well, the next trip is going to be... So I, I assume that of course range will, will come back. But in, in, in the way, whatever. Brian, this is a stupid question for us, to us, to people like us. <laughs> but that, oh, that sorry, concerns Nick. me that the people buying EVs really, that there are things that, that you know, this would be scary to somebody. And uh, Nick's obviously an EV enthusiast, oh, yeah. but a regular person who doesn't care, who just goes out and buys their next car, might be very concerned about this if they don't know about it. Yeah. That's right. You're going to look at the, the range thing. Now, the one thing I can recommend is, um, I don't know if you can do this in, in your car, but in a Tesla, you can change the battery to percentage rather than yeah. miles or kilometers. So... When you when I first bought my car, yeah, it would give me the range in kilometers and started around 400 kilometers. Um, but then you tend to get obsessed about that range, and every time you plug it in, it's like, oh, it's it's five kilometers less than it was last time I charged it. Um, so I just switched it to percentage, and so then you don't end up obsessing about that mileage. But then if you're going on a trip, you use the trip calculator, and the trip calculator will tell you in a Tesla that gives you a graph that says, okay, you'll get at your destination and your battery will be 20%. Yeah. And that's what you monitor. And, you know, sometimes it's a little bit off in a Tesla. Now, these days, it about that's pretty 5 good, though, error actually, for, is, the, for is this, they are getting the most, better. Yeah. It used to be about a 10% error. Uh, where it would tell you, oh, your battery will be 20% at your destination. And then yeah, the leaf there, is way worse, like though. It's the worst of all um, of them, yeah. Is that right? <laughs> um, go ahead. Yeah. So that's one yeah. tip. Yeah, it's switching it to percentage and not, not worrying about it. Now, when you get to the summer and it is not giving you the same range, it is always possible that your, you know, your battery has cells that have deteriorated or something. So it is something you have to, to keep an eye on. But Yeah, and the way we do it on the out. Leaf is you put in the little data reader you buy on Amazon. It's a Bluetooth device for 20 bucks. It hooks up to an app for your car that's made by a third party. Mine's called Leaf Spy. Oh, yeah. uh, Tesla's a little different because they have a different connector. I don't know how you guys do it or even if you need to. But there would be, if you got into this, uh, you can see how your battery is doing and, and know the state of health of it. Um, but this means nothing, okay? So mm -hmm. let's say you lived in Hawaii where it's the same temperature every day. If you drove like a mad person for yeah. a day or two, it would show that you have a lesser battery, right? Because you're driving with a heavy lead foot. Yeah. But if you're driving like um, a, a nun... Yeah then you're going very slow and gentle and that's going to show a higher range. So it's just, it's not really showing what your battery is capable of. It's just what it's capable of based on your recent driving. And that yeah. is a weird concept to get around to people. Yeah. Um, and also I'll mention too, it is typical for batteries to lose range, like battery degradation. And the typical formula seems to be you are going to lose about 5% about 5% of your mm -hmm. battery in the first couple of Slows years. Slows down. And then it kind of levels out. So I assume my battery has lost about 5% of its capacity, but I, I don't know yeah, exactly and it's, how it's I would not confirm that. something you should obsess about. You should know that when you buy the EV, that that's why I always say buy bigger than you think you need. And um, then you don't worry about that. Yeah. Right. And it's always a good thing. But there's mm -hmm. lots we can talk about here very quickly. Okay. Now, the first thing is that in winter, uh, a gas car loses range. You just don't notice it. You're not thinking about that. Right. There's many factors. There is the yeah. dense winter air. So your aerodynamics are off. This affects EVs a little bit more because they're more efficient and they're also usually more um, dependent on the aerodynamics of the vehicle for efficiency. So, and then you have, uh, it's sort of, if you put winter tires on, that's going to be less efficient for sure. That could lose you 10%. It could lose you even more, depending on your winter tires. Um, there's the snow on the ground or ice on the ground. The, the fact that it's just not uh, a smooth rolling surface, that's going to, um, you know, is it's like if you're pedaling a bike on through snow, it's going to be harder to pedal that bike. So, right? Uh, there's different factors like that. Um mm -hmm. It can't hold as much of a charge, the battery, in colder weather. And 
don't forget that you're using your battery to heat your cabin. Uh -huh. Um, that is a lot of heat, even if it's a heat pump, even if it's just a, you know, not that cold, but a little bit cold, you're still using a lot of energy. In fact, in, uh, it's, it's different in every car. Your car is a PTC heater. Mine is, is too. So it's just like a toaster. It's like yeah. red hot elements heating up. That's the least efficient. And then the heat pumps, sometimes there's both a heat pump and a PTC heater. Sometimes there's just a heat pump and you know, that uses less energy, but uh, it still uses energy, Brian. Yeah. No, when I checked in the Mustang Mach-E does not have a heat pump heater. So it has a, a normal. Oh, heater, really? Which is, yeah, not as, as energy efficient. So, you know, definitely going to lose range with that. Yeah. You're definitely, definitely going to use range. And you, my, my, unless you're using it to make these long trips on the highway, then that's when the only time you really need to concern yourself, unless you have a long commute. For the most part, if you can charge every night at home, you just don't think about it, Nick. Yeah. Don't think about it. Enjoy your fast heating car mm -hmm. and your efficiency and, and how wonderful it is. And, um, you know, keep us up to date too, as, as you drive it through the winter, because we're not in the worst part of winter yet. Uh, drop us a line again on how you like the car and how it made it through the winter. Yeah. And it's really only on road trips that you ever need to think about it. Like it's you, if, if you're just driving around the city, like you said, you charge at home, you know, you're, you're always going to have enough. Uh, with Tesla, they spaced the superchargers about 150 kilometers apart, roughly. It varies a bit. So that's about, you know, about a hundred miles apart. So um, if you're going to go, Nick, on a road trip, you know, you want to make sure that there is a charging station roughly every hundred miles and, you know, you should be fine. Like around here, when it does get minus 40, I don't think it's going to get to minus 40 where Nick is. So he's probably not going to have to worry about it, but they, they space them about right. So mine, I've got the standard range Tesla model three, and it can just barely make it between chargers when it's minus 40. If it's only minus 20, minus 15 Celsius, not really an issue. I mean, it's not constantly minus 40, but no. we call that the worst case scenario around yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. EV drivers call that, we have to be, you want to be prepared for the worst case scenario. We've gone years without it getting that cold. Yeah. And then the last couple of years, it's gotten a few days that cold. It, so you want to be prepared for those days. And it's usually only that cold overnight, but last right. winter, and this was covered on the podcast, I drove up to Saskatoon and the daytime temperatures was minus 36 Celsius, which is about minus 32 Fahrenheit. Daytime temperatures, this was at noon. And that's what I had to drive through and, uh, you know, just, just kind of barely made it in my standard range car. Yeah. So that's an issue. And another thing to keep in mind is if you are doing highway trips that in winter, it charges slower. Yeah. The battery can't take the charge as fast because it's, it's like regenerative braking too. You can't put yeah. your brakes back into the battery pack as well yeah. when it's cold. No, that's kind of the biggest thing for me because summer road trips where I'm only spending about 20 minutes at the charger, but the winter road trips in these, these cold conditions, it's more like you're spending an hour at the charger. And at that point it, it gets annoying. And I'm at the point now where if this winter I have to drive up to Saskatoon and it's minus 40, I'm, I'm good to take a gas car because I I just, I just don't want that, uh, have to wait an hour at the charging station. Yeah. And if, uh, you know, it's the worst case scenario in the worst place in the world is what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And we tell people around here that it, you could lose up to 50%. It, it varies from car to car. Okay. I've heard somebody talking about 17%, uh, in his Ionic five, uh, when it wasn't too cold. Okay. Yeah. So but that's like the worst, worst case scenario. Now, if you're driving around the city and you do, you know, 60 miles in a day at the very worst and you have, you know, 170 miles, who cares? You plug in at yeah. night, it's going to charge the same way as it always does. If you're on the highway and it takes you a half hour to charge, it might take you an hour to charge. And that's a major change too yeah. in habits to be yeah. aware of. And of course, electric cars, they're not as efficient on the highway as they are in the city. Higher speeds are tougher for electric cars. You, you drain the battery a lot faster. And I really wish that when they publicized the range for electric cars, that they did a highway figure and a city figure. I think that's the way it should be done, but they don't do that. They pick a number kind of somewhere in between the two. 
Yeah. But, you know, you'll get used to this, Nick. There's a lot of weird little things that people fret about when they try something new. I did it. Brian did it. It's normal. Uh, we EV owners tend to think too much, but uh, just enjoy the car. Um, you'll get used to it and uh, tell your friends about it. Time for the lightning round, a fast-paced look at the rest of the news. And Brian, we've overstayed our welcome, so which is good because I don't have a lot of stories this week. Rivian starts international deliveries of the RT R1T rather and the R1S in Canada. So you've seen one here, right? Yeah, it must have been an American one uh, that drove up over the border because I saw one on the road. But yeah, officially. Deliveries of the Rivian just started in Canada. Now, post the um, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, next era expects wind with storage will cost $14 per megawatt hour in the United States later this decade. This is only because this act was passed. And solar with batteries, $17 per megawatt hour. This is down because of this act. 35 to 44 percent from before the IRA was passed. This is how much the IRA is going to affect yeah. everything and speed things up, if I may say. Yeah, for sure. This is a Brian story. I can't believe you didn't see this one, Brian. There's a induction oven maker who has added a battery to their stoves. <laughs> Lithium battery. Um, this is because I guess some of these induction stoves use a lot of draw, right? And yeah. Need, and some no, places I, aren't wired for it and you'd have to get an extra panel if your panel's full. Yeah. So they've solved that problem, interestingly, with putting a battery in a stove. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the big draw, when you need it, comes from the batteries. Well, we and, talked about and, this before in terms of heat pump water heaters, because that's a similar problem with those, because you tend to need, you know, a few thousand watts to run those. I think up to 7,000 watts to run an induction cooktop. So that's a lot of juice. It's one of the reasons I did a panel upgrade on my house, but it cost a few thousand dollars to go from 100 amp to 200 amp. So I guess the idea is you can charge up this battery and uh, so it can draw more power. You can sort of just plug it into in a regular outlet, as it were, mm -hmm. but with the battery have much bigger output. Right. Uh, so that solves that problem, but it's just weird to have that sort of appliance with a battery in it. Yeah. And I imagine it adds to the price, but it's cheaper than maybe wiring, rewiring your house if you want to do that. So it's, I thought I thought it was quite interesting. BYD, the Chinese um, mostly EV maker and bus maker, has sold us three millionth BEV or PHEV. I thought that was an interesting milestone, three millionth. Yeah. Some are plug-in hybrids, but that's still an impressive number. Oh, it's time for a CS Fast Fact. 636 fossil fuel lobbyists were preying on government delegations at COP27. 636. Oily bastards. That's a lot. Scotland approves a 38 megawatt solar plant next door to a closed nuclear plant. And guess how much the objections were in the community? Zero! No objections. <laughs> Were there objections? Will they put up a nuclear plant? Probably. Probably some concern. Solar? Not so harmful. Not so scary. A village in the French Alps, this is from CNN, demolishes its ski lift because there's no snow left. It hasn't snowed in years. Oh, no. This is a... Where's my... The lack of snow meant that the last time it ran was about 15 years ago. And just for one weekend, and since then, it has not been... This is sad, sad. That's very sad. This is why the Winter Olympics will now be held in Qatar with fake <laughs> snow and perhaps potato flakes. Finally this week, India is looking to produce its own solar modules to meet all of its demand and then some. That's right. India requires a lot of solar and they want to make it themselves. You know, it makes sense. Yeah. Perfectly capable country of ramping up... Um, Something like this. They're looking for takers for $2.4 billion in government aid to offer um, stimulation to domestic manufacturing of solar equipment. They want to do all of their solar and export a little as well. That's that is good. our time for this week and a bunch more. I apologize to myself more than anything. 
my body wasn't ready to to go long. It was ready to go short this week, and I went long. I'm sorry. We'll have a nap. I will. Well, I did through part of you when you're talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we'd like to hear from you. Contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on social media as cleanenergypod at cleanenergypod. Uh, leave us a voicemail, speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. That's the best way we like to hear from you. And if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app, rate and review us because, well, why not? New episodes come every week if you subscribe. So see you next week. See you next week.